So uh, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for, for coming to this uh, second of three events. Um, these events are really focused around creating smarter content and how we can accelerate digital transformation in our customers. Um, just like the last event, this event is all around inspire, inspiring you uh, to find new ways of building smarter content and using the power of Mark Logic and its partners to, to enable you to do that, find new ways of enriching your content and new business opportunities that it presents. Um, we're gonna discuss semantics, entities, knowledge graphs, and the ways that those can come together uh, to give you new opportunities. Um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to use the Zoom um, chat features. Uh, you can either just put them in directly or, or aim them specifically at Phil Miller. Um, and we'll gather those together and we've got a Q&A session at the end uh, that we can talk things through. As we said, this is event two of three. So if you want the previous event details, again, please do let us know in the chat and we can send out a link if you weren't on the previous event. Um, and this will be recorded and we'll send out the links uh, later on. So I wanted to start with this quote. This was actually a quote from one of our customers. Um, I've, I've dropped the company name, but um, I think it's a nice quote that really speaks to the fact that we've got so much knowledge in our organizations and, and we just lose it time and time again. And it would be really powerful if we had that knowledge available to us and to our customers. If only we could find a way to package it and present it and make it easy to be consumed. And that's really what today's session is all about. So we're gonna to touch on uh, the value in the content stores that you've got and how we can mine those content stores and look for metadata that we can pull out and enrich and create new relationships, new semantic meaning behind the content that you've got. And we know everyone at the moment is looking at ways of segmenting their content into smaller chunks and enriching it. And most of you on this call are already Mark Logic customers, and therefore you're already some way on that journey. You know, you've got the tools there available to you to do a lot of these things that we're, we're going to talk about. And I wanted to start with this example. We touched on it on the last event, uh, if anybody was, uh, it was in that one. But I think it's a really nice one that, that Walters Kluwer created. And they took their content and segmented it down into smaller chunks. So they broke it down into smaller content objects. And then they enriched it with more information. So they actually aligned it to their ontology. And you can see here in the, in the user interface, as you're doing a search, say in this case for auto cost, it pre-populates and says, okay, I can see that that's what you mean. And it shows a list of available options from the ontology. And you can select auto cost. And then because it now knows where in the ontology you are, it offers up the next level of the hierarchy and says, okay, do you now mean one of these things? And you can select that if it's appropriate. And then this person's putting a free text keyword of percentage. So now it's gonna find the right piece of content that's aligned to that particular area in the ontology and has the keyword percentage in it and bring you back the actual content rather than a link to the document. So I think it's a really nice example of finding those entities, showing that knowledge graph and presenting it to a customer in a way that adds value. And as we said, you know, most of you are probably MarkLogic customers on this call already. And therefore, you're probably already somewhere on this journey. You know, you've already got your content in a semi-structured or structured manner. You're storing it in MarkLogic and you're indexing it and you're making it available to search in some way. The last session was all focused on then taking ontologies and taxonomies and the value of those and, and, and what they bring to smarter content. And then today's session is all on, let's assume you've got one of those in place. What can we do with it? How do we add that knowledge and build on top of it? So today, you, as we said, one of three events. Today's event, you're going to hear from um, Datavid, who are going to do a demo of uh, some technology that they've got available to help uh, ease the process of creating the entities and aligning entity extraction. And you'll also hear from Smart Logic, and we've got a lot of customers that are using Smart Logic in their active deployments at the moment. 
Week three, we'll touch on this again later on. Week three is all around the next generation opportunities, you know, the exciting things that you can do once you've got a knowledge graph. And we'll show some example technology that we've built. We'll talk about some existing customers that we've worked with. And we've also got 67 Bricks talking about, you know, the digital transformation that they've gone through and, and they take their customers through. So let's just uh, scene set a bit on a few key terms as well, which will probably pop up quite a lot today in discussions. Um, so what do we mean around semantics? Semantics for us is just additional metadata. There's additional meta that defines the meaning of something and allows you to provide some information around the way those things are related. So it's more metadata to define context to your content. Triples, uh, this isn't aimed at being a particularly technical session, but triples may get mentioned a few times. And triples are just a way of storing that semantic relationship. So you have what they call a subject, a predicate, an object. So a subject might be uh, a book, the predicate is authored by, and the object is William Shakespeare. So it's just a way of taking two things and connecting it together. And RDF is the way of storing that information. It's a, a standard uh, framework for storing triple information. Sparkle, again, you might hear that mentioned quite a bit. Sparkle is just a query language that you use to look at that triple data. So uh, just like you had SQL in relational world, Sparkle is the, the equivalent in the, in the RDF world. Entity enrichment. Uh, this is sort of one of the key areas, I think, that people have got a lot of content. So this is about looking at your content and finding the things that matter to you as a business and as a customer. So actually pulling out of the content things, it may be customer names, it may be drug names, it may be product names, whatever it is that would provide key information to your customers and the way they want to navigate the content. And the knowledge graph is bringing all of that together. So once you've got your content and you've added all of this layer of knowledge around it, you have built up a knowledge graph. So what does that mean for us? Well, some practical examples, say here on the left-hand side, we've got um, an article that we've created. And from that article, we've read through, we've pulled out the entities that matter in this case. And they might be uh, chemicals, they might be pests, they might be authors. So this has gone through and pulled out all of the entities that matter around this particular article and shown how they relate to the article. And you might click on one of those and do an additional search and pull back more content that matches that. You might pull in more link data. So for example, here on the author, you can see it links off to their ORCID ID. So maybe pull in some data here and add that to your knowledge graph. And the example on the right-hand side is, is a representation of that knowledge graph in the background. So we've got works, pieces of content. We might have a relationship to where we source the rights for that piece of content. We might have a relationship to how it sits in a product in terms of its structure and its, its product categorization. And we might have some sort of alignment to a standard that that content was created for. So again, you build up this graph of links and understanding. And why does that matter? Well, if we look through an example here, on the left-hand side, we've got a bunch of standards. Uh, in this case, it's an educational publisher. So we can say, you know, there are different math standards around the world that a government defines that you have to meet. And we might create our own internal standard as a business and say, okay, this is how we, we look at maths. This is all the things that we want to cover. And you can create a relationship between those standards and your standards. So you can say, this is how these standards come together. And you'll go away and you'll, you'll author a piece of content that says, okay, I'm going to create something around function machines. Here's my piece of content around function machines. And I can align that to my standard and say, I created this piece of content to meet this particular part of the standard. And I might even create a relationship that says, okay, I, I have got the rights to use this piece of content in a particular territory or quantity. So now what I can do is I can take that a step further and say, well, I created this maths course for UK GCSE, but how well does it align to Texas maths or Indian math standards? 
And because I've aligned these things together, I can actually start to query and look at the relationships and see how well this piece of content would fit with other standards. And because I've got the right information, I can even see, do I have the right to sell that content within these markets? And now, rather than creating one piece of content, I've got the understanding of which markets I can sell it in, how well it aligns to those other markets, and where the gaps are that I'd need to author to create a new product into those markets. So a knowledge graph can be a really powerful way of bringing all of this together. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna hand on to Michael, who uh, has worked on a customer use case at Amgen. And uh, Michael, I hand over to you to give uh, an update on that. All right, well, well thank you everyone for, for joining this. Um, uh, as, as James said, this is a customer presentation. This was not developed by me. It was developed by Dr. Claire Augustine of, of Amgen. She presented it at one of our events uh, a while back. I have since prevented, uh, presented it a number of times. I, I worked with her at Amgen as her customer success representative. Um, so I'm familiar with her application. But as you can see, the title is uh, Semantic Technology Assisted data harmonization and joining. They used our multi-model database to join information coming from multiple sources within their distribution pipeline. And their goal in this case was to optimize the transportation of drugs from one location to another throughout the world. And we'll show you how they um, did that with semantics and multi-modeling. So let me hit uh, next here. So. Um, I hope many of you know Amgen. Uh, they're a worldwide uh, pharmaceutical company. They work in several areas that you see here. Uh, we won't go into each of them, but they bring us some excellent products um, and they've been doing that for years. Um, they struggled with a problem of managing reference data. And this is often a problem that you see across a number of industries, whether it's financial services, in this case, pharmaceutical, um, insurance, and reference data are things uh, that label and create standards around common business terms. So um, states or country uh, abbreviations. In financial services, it's stock symbols. In, in pharmaceuticals, it, it's things like drug names and other um, common entities. And they have a problem keeping those uh, in sync because uh, it, could be, it could be time consuming. Different systems use different representations. And although there are industry bodies that work on standardizing these vocabularies and integrating them, it's still difficult because in, in enterprises, as they get larger, um, different organizations to get their jobs done tend to deviate from standards if, if they're not tightly defined. Uh, so um, Amgen, in this case, they wanted to um, streamline a process a distribution process, and they put it in the context of, of their overall product life cycle. Now, I like these kinds of diagrams. You see them across every industry or most industries. This is a, a typical, very high level product life cycle. Uh, for a pharmaceutical industry. So it begins with um, discovery and basic fundamental research and some group of researchers come up with something that looks promising. So they develop it further and it might go into a preclinical trial uh, and then a clinical trial and then they launch a drug and then it's off to distribution. So this is a typical product life cycle. In this case, it's specialized for the pharmaceutical industry. You see it often in manufacturing. They might have their version of that where it starts starts with the back of a napkin, a conceptual model, then it goes into design and development, then manufacturing and support. Software development has a very similar uh, life cycle. But the key thing is that along the way, you have to manage data, you have to manage metadata. That's what drives these process. So the business opportunity here is to integrate all that information, that metadata, and bring uh, what they call bench to bedside connectivity. I, th these are other expressions I like in, in manufacturing. You see things like art to part and agriculture, farm to family. There's a, a lot of good phrases that capture this life cycle. But bringing the information together is the name of the game. Uh, 
So this is the problem they were faced with. And why is it very difficult? Well, as many of you on this call know, there are so many different sources uh, on what I call the upstream side of this process. So you have relational databases, um, social media as of late, um, uh, office files, emails, and they talk about the same business entity. So in this case, this is a chemical compound, uh, but they all semantically mean the same thing. And in order to get the job done, to execute the business process, you have to know that these mean the same thing. And, and, and it could be difficult if there, is a, if there aren't direct links or something to tell you that these things are similar. And it's also difficult because often domain knowledge, whether it resides in a person or some, or some document that you have, is just not included in your overall process. So you like to bring this uh, context in to, to, the, uh, to the operations. So what Amgen does is to capture their knowledge uh, in modules and they, and they link it. So the modules are sort of the business entities. They have drug ontologies, organizational ontologies. And again, think of this as enterprise wide now. Here they're thinking about their entire um, organization. So what this could do for them is to maximize um, cross-functional integration. Um, it enables search of information across these functions, and it gives them a consistent vocabulary. So again, it, it aids in communication. And with this integrated information, if they, uh, as many organizations are doing, it helps, could help drive machine learning activities, which is very powerful for various types of analytics, those high level prescription and prediction type analytics. And in the end, it just uh, empowers the user to get jobs done and deliver good products. Okay, now um, Amgen has the ability to leverage this technology across a variety of different domains, uh, whether it's delivering drugs all the way out to uh, answering regulators. In this particular case, as we dive a little bit deeper, we're gonna talk about a logistics problem they had. So when they create products, they need to ship it worldwide from their manufacturing facilities. And they have the concept of lanes and it's just what you would think it is. It's a path from point A to point B with a lot of stops in between. And you can imagine when you go across uh, in the US state boundaries, uh, country boundaries, um, and then different transportation methods, different rules, regulations, you could see how those various stops or transition points do things in a different way from an informational perspective. And that has to be managed to get a 360 view of this entire um, process. So here's another look at it. Uh, the green would be the start point, red would be the end point. And here are some of the things you have to monitor uh, that are contained in what's called lane data, the route. So you have an origin, a destination, and then you have carriers like FedEx and UPS and shippers. And then there's technical information that you wanna monitor along the way. In this particular case, for this proof of value that we did, which, which went into production, they wanted to make sure that they monitored temperature. Um, they're very wary of things called temperature excursions. If a package along the way reaches, goes above a specific temperature, I'm um, not sure what they do with it, but maybe it just, you know, they have to get rid of it and start all over. But this type of information, it's um, when they evaluate these shipping lanes, they need to merge it with uh, order data, which is, resides in relational database systems. This information up at the top is more document oriented. Uh, and then the technical information that we talked about in this case, temperature. And if they can do that, if they can unite this information, get the 360 view, they get insights on efficiency, cost, and risk. So the very, very um, important business uh, attributes, you know, metrics that they wanna track in this process. And I think they had hundreds, if not over a thousand lanes that they had to evaluate in, the, in their operation. So these are the challenges. Uh, as we mentioned, data often lies in documents. It's not in relational tables with clear identifiers. And in order to connect the data, they had to deal with these semantic gaps. 
So you can imagine something is represented differently in a JSON document or XML document as opposed to a, a, a relational table. Um, there really was no master data oversight. So they were able to leverage Mark uh, Logic's agile mastering. Okay. And then again, in many cases, um, they had to uh, rely on entities or work with entities that were outside of the organization. Not everything was in their own jurisdiction. So they had no platform to, to connect all this information. All right, so this looks like a very busy slide, but it's gonna make sense hopefully once I describe it. On the left here, this is a document. This is a lane document. And although it looks very structured on the picture, but behind it, it's really, um, it's not a relational system that has clear columns. It's mostly markup. So you see things like origin and transportation service provider, but this is difficult to unite this information with the information on the left. So on the right here, this is, it's an Excel spreadsheet, but it comes from their SAP database. So that is a relational system. And this is neatly aligned tables and rows and columns. The same thing down here, this is another database, excuse me, that has more technical information. It's called a CCM database. So what they needed to do was to unite the information here or join it with the relational information here. So it's uh, unstructured meets structured. And the key challenge was to join this data. There was no connecting key between this lane form and the relational database coming from SAP and, and what they call their CCM database. So you have a content management system and an operational management system. And what they use were, um, their tools, the semaphore to create the uh, taxonomies and ontologies and mark logic. So let's, uh, and, and this is just a quick glance of um, their semaphore tool. So in the middle is uh, their label for the form and you can see they're establishing these RDF triples that James just talked about. This form has a broader meaning, different, uh, different uh, phrases or terms that apply to it. It uses a shipper. It has destination companies. So they're showing here, they're starting to build the knowledge graph of how uh, their lane information could relate to information that's contained in their relational database. And this is the tool that they used. Now, here's another busy slide, but hopefully it'll make sense. Um, think of these as three rows. This is a, a row with a column heading from the SAP database, okay, these first two rows here. This is the other database, the CCM database. And down here is information from the lane form. We use color coding here. So it's very easy to unite the two relational information uh, rows because the label is the same. See, it says delivery note number and delivery note number down here, and the value is the same. So that's a, your basic table join, right? But when it comes to relating the information from relational systems to a document, you have a different story. And we're using the, now the colors show that this information is related, but that's only because we have a knowledge expert behind it. We've got Claire Augustine or, or one of our coworkers. So you can see what's different. This says shipping plant name, and this says origin company name, completely different label, but those actually mean the same thing semantically. And even the value, so this is the reference data. It says Amgen Europe and down here it says Amgen Europe and it's got different letters tacked onto it. That might be okay for a human to understand. They could say, oh, that's the same, but a machine needs to understand it if you wanna automate this delivery process and do things in an automated fashion. And you have a couple of other examples here. Carrier route code is the label. Here it says transportation provider, different values. Same thing with container and shipper name. So inconsistent labels, right? Inconsistent reference data, and it leads to data gaps. And again, the goal is to automate it uh, and get the machines to understand it. And although they seem to be getting very smart these days, it's, it's still kind of difficult for them to do this. So this is where Mark Logic's uh, smart mastering comes in and semantics. So here uh, they're able to set rules now to determine um, what 
is actually the same. So you can see here it says shipping lane name is equal to origin company name, right? And let's go back. Shipping lane, shipping lane, origin company. So they made that match. Same thing down here, carrier route transportation service provider. So they set up a rule, carrier route transportation service provider. So we won't go through all of them, but these are the rules that they established and they give a weight to each of those rules. Now these don't have to be exact matches. They could be something like a synonym match, which is taken care of by your ontologies and um, taxonomies. They could, we have in Mark Logic, uh, double metaphone, Levenstein distance, various ways of matching data, sort of a fuzzy match, right? Once you get a certain rule to match, you assign it a weight, um, and then you set a threshold. And here's various thresholds. We didn't put the actions here, but the various actions you could take on a threshold is if it, if it meets, a, if it over jumps over the very highest level and you say those things mean the same. And in the rest of our process, we're gonna treat those as the same and just let, let this automation go through, um, whether it's for fulfilling this order or delivering this order or doing analytics on this order. Uh, and in other cases, another action item might be to alert someone uh, and get uh, maybe go through another set of rule processing or have some human intervention at that point. But this is how they join the data and they harmonize it. Uh, and it all happens within Mark Logic. So you may have seen a diagram like this in a prior session or other workings with Mark Logic. This is the data hub pattern right in the middle. So uh, Mark Logic is able to ingest data from upstream data sources. Uh, we say as is, because as we're ingesting, we're indexing and making it immediately available. But the key concept here to understand is the information on the left side, the upstream side, could be any type of data. And I, here I only list a few, but in some of our uh, customers, there's hundreds of different data sources. So we looked at lane form data, that's semi-structured um, form type information. This SAP CCNM, that's um, relational information. Semaphore uh, data is graph type data. Geospatial data, we didn't even talk about that but there's a geolocation coordinates. And then you could even have binary documents, uh, which we will process. Uh, we could do character record. We could bring in the metadata from those documents and then OCR those documents as well. And we talked about social media. Uh, one of the key aspects of that, which I think many of you are familiar with, is that this data changes often. New data sources are coming into your organization, into your processes. Uh, comes from mergers and acquisitions, new partners that you work with, new information sources that you develop within your own organization. So this is constantly changing. Downstream, over on the right, call that downstream. Now here we just show more of a analytics type, logistics dashboards, reporting dashboards, business intelligence. What, what we don't see here are the operational applications that you might have. So web forms, mobile applications, handhelds, right? Things to run the business. So this is more of a, an observe your business, but you also have the myriad uh, choices of applications that run your business. And the idea is with the, with the data hub pattern is to manage the various changes with a stable uh, environment, data environment that manages your security, your scalability, and your harmonization and your mastering. And the goal is to stay agile. That's, that's the name of the game. Um, sometimes that might be an overly used term, but it's, it's a very good one because that's the challenge that or, all organizations are facing. And this is my final slide here. This is the application they developed. It's um, built on a JavaScript framework. So very, very easy to have. It's kind of a search and discovery application when you look at it, very much like if you're going shopping at, at Amazon or, or one of your favorite stores, this is a search bar at top where you can put keywords, Booleans, expressions. On the left, there's various uh, browsing capabilities. So faceted by dates, some technical information. See, in this case, they're looking for you know, temperature excursions. Um, you can facet by origin company, destination company. And then the results are, are, uh, are in the middle here. And then there's this, uh, 
a cool map feature where you just want to click and and do some analytics by location. This would be more of a detailed shot once you clicked on one of your, one of the elements of your result set. So this this application is evolving, but this is this is what was produced in the proof of value, and then it went into production. And um, the whole idea, as I mentioned in the beginning was to evaluate these lanes. They had hundreds, if not uh, over a thousand different lanes in their business process to make sure that their costs were optimized, uh, the, the, the drugs, the shipments were getting to the customers uh, in the right time period. That's very, very important. Uh, and risk, you know, drug companies like financial service companies, insurance companies, they have uh, lots of regulatory reporting um, to make sure that they're keeping things safe uh, with, uh, worldwide. So um, that's it. Um, open to questions here. Uh, hopefully that was clear and you got some value out of that. But that's how uh, one of our customers, Amgen, in this case, is using our multi-model database and semantics for, for, their, uh, for their operations, their analytics, and for reducing risks. Thanks, Michael. I think, sure. I think that was really interesting. And I think one of the nice things and the reasons we wanted to do this was to show that from the content, you can do more than just serve it up as a search. You know, you can drive new things by looking for the value in that content and finding those entities. So, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of value here. And, uh, yeah, this was, a difficult, this was a difficult problem for them, and um, it's, it's helping them in many ways. Wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. Uh, Datavid uh, takes what you've just seen with Michael in terms of looking at the entities in those documents and uh, their example is a whole uh, UI built around the concept of taking, looking for those entities, extracting them and uh, adding value. So uh, Balvinda, I hope you're there and we'll hand over to you. Should we start with the agenda, Balvinder? Yeah. So we'll talk about introduction to Datavid, who we are, what we do, uh, our experience with entity extraction in Datavid. We try to focus our presentation and demo on the entity extraction bit because that's the core topic of today's uh, uh, presentation and series. And then we'll uh, show a demo on entity extraction and how we have used it. Um, and, and then we'll talk about Datavid Rover, which is a solution or a platform we are building um, which uh, uses mark logic, but uses entity extraction and the kind of use case that uh, Michael talked about with Amgen. Uh, we have experience in uh, solving these use cases. So we'll talk about what data with Rover provides. Um, and then in the end, some Q&A. Uh, so next slide, Alex. So who we are, uh, we are a niche software uh, development company, a consultancy company. We help enterprises to build intelligent data platforms. Now, intelligent data platforms are the ones which Michael just showcased that Amgen built. Uh, we um, work on, we use proven technology. So um, uh, what that means is use technologies like MarkLogic, which is a multi-model database, allows you to put your data uh, coming from, you know, relational or different data silos, uh, varied hybrid applications you might have built, put it in one place and give you a single place where you can view all your data and derive meaning from all your data by doing, you know, enriching your data, enriching your content, uh, using ontologies or using machine learning models, doing entity extraction using those models and then providing some nice visualization, search UI, or APIs, which can be used by downstream systems. Uh, this, uh, thanks, Alex. So our services, we provide advisory uh, around, you know, your data strategy, data governance, how you can look at your existing data and how it can be uh, used to derive more meaning out of the data. Uh, software development, uh, we are full stack development, we provide full stack development capabilities. We are a niche company and we focus on, you know, building the kind of products that Amgen built uh, and solving the business problems that the enterprises might be having with their data. So data intelligence, automation, so building your data hubs and building them with microservices, with microservices which you can replace and or uh, add to, uh, you know, uh, try out uh, new models with your data. Uh, we build cloud-ready scalable software, which can be hosted on AWS, on-prem, or Azure. 
we have a lot of expertise in NoSQL um, with, with MarkLogic, with, with graph databases and semantics experience. And we also do support and maintenance. So what that means is if you have already existing investment in MarkLogic, we can help you there as well and with cloud migration strategies. Next slide, Alex. Our team, uh, Mark, uh, DataVid was founded in 2018 by uh, ex-MarkLogic consultants. We have a team of uh, 25 right now spread across UK, Romania, and India. We uh, specialize in MarkLogic, but we specialize in full stack. So doing your front end as well as your middle tier development in Java, J2E, um, and uh, using semantics uh, technologies as well. Next slide, Alex. Sounds good. Then, uh, yeah, if we get with the intro, let's get to the main point of, of this presentation, which is uh, entity extraction. And what we first want to start with is a bit describe the types of entity extraction that we are going to discuss in this presentation. And also, these are mostly the types we saw in our customers. The first type would be some entity, we called it entity recognition because it's based on have uh, on using some already tagged data. So if we uh, if our custom, if one of our clients for solving his problem has any tag data or has any means of tagging uh, some data, we can we might want to go into that direction and build a model to to extract entities based on the data. Or I'm also going to dis describe a bit entity linking, which is uh, ties a bit into what uh, Michael presented as well. And uh, when our customers has an ex existing ontology or some existing vocabulary that we can refer to, then we know what uh, what entities we're looking for. So we're going to try to link those entities to, to the content that you have in, in, in the documents. Okay, then first we want to go into why would you use entity extraction? So we want to present some of the use cases where we saw that entity extraction actually solved the problems for our customers. A first use case would be discovery. So having uh, entity extraction, so having that uh, extra metadata on your documents can help you do things like cognitive search, which uh, sounds like a, a buzzword, but is something to, to a deeper, more advanced search than uh, text search. Basically searching based on that metadata and based on your knowledge graph and applying that, that information on the document and using that information to find something relevant. Also, you can link this concept. So if you're having a data hub, as described uh, before, you can start linking these concepts and then you'll, you'll know what to suggest in the search. You'll know what, what other synonyms you can look for in the documents to provide the relevant search res results to the user. And you can also do some sort of categorization. You can know, okay, these are these types of documents. So you can better sort your data, better categorize it and make use of it. And this this uh, this use case we've actually saw, uh, saw in our one of our clients, which is a life science company, and what we helped them was with improving the discoverability of their uh, materials of the research phase in R and D projects. So basically, whenever they were starting a new project, they had this research phase to see, okay, what did we do before? What our competitors are doing? What's there in the market? And that's that's a usual process for them but the, their documents were all over the place. So they were in network drives, they were in external systems. So we brought all this in together. We tied it up with their knowledge graph and we helped them uh, make use of that. So be, uh, have more advanced searches and find everything. So then increasing that discoverability and easing that, uh, that research phase for their projects. Another use case that we came across was automation. So basically, if you have this metadata, you have these extractions, you can add some actions, some rule-based actions to, to be performed on this, on this data. And you can do some automatic validation checks. The, the most relevant use case we, we saw here was for a transport company. They had the, this business process when uh, wherever a transport was about to begin, they had to send over to their headquarters some permits, which was a basic check. Like someone needs to get that by email. They need to check, okay, is, is this still valid? 
what's the location where they go? Do we need extra certificates or extra permissions for this? Now, this was done on their side by a person, but what we managed to do was a proof of concept to get that document from the email, OCR it, so get the content out of it, extract some relevant entities like, okay, extract what's the validity date, what's the issue date, extract the location and do some automa automatic validations. Like, okay, if the, this permit is still active and it's going to a location where we have an agreement already, just automatically approve it, send back an email to the, to the transporter and then say, it, okay, you're, you're good to go. And this, you can imagine it, made them easy for them to to process these uh, types of permits and then it also uh, yeah make it faster of course that's what automation is for another use case that is very important especially in uh, in financial and healthcare in these industries is compliance so basically uh, having this uh, these entities and doing linking between data you can have more advanced compliance checks so basically if we know which person uh, is mentioned in a contract and what activity he has done, then we can uh, we can put some checks on that compliance as well. And this was a news case for our for one of our clients in the financial sector, where uh, again connecting his uh, both relational data with data entities that we extracted from uh, non uh, relational like non uh, yeah non relational data like documents basically like contracts. We use that, we link those entities together and we put checks on top of that to say, okay, if this person who needs to, to respect this, uh, this agreement then does any type of activity in where he shouldn't basically, it's gonna breach compliance. So you can trigger an alert on that. And another use case we actually saw is the visibility, it's like bringing visibility to your data. And this was like providing a 360 view on, on your data. So linking all these entities, you might be able to build these nice graphs that we're seeing everywhere and uh, actually empowering this uh, data-driven business to, to, to have better decision in this and have, of course, insights and analytics on top, on top of that. And this, this case we've saw when building a data hub for uh, one of uh, our clients in the pharmaceutical industry. And what we did on top of what integrating that data in the data hub, we also augmented that with ex additional metadata to make, to extract more insights and more analytics so they can know, okay, what to, what to use in moving in, in a certain direction. And I think for this specific use case, we they were using clinical trials. So they wanted to, to get more insights out of clinical trials. So they don't have, so they can share data basically between trials. So they don't have to research a specific drug that was already tested again. Okay, now we've done, uh, yeah, I've talked you through the use cases, but let's see some, uh, some extraction examples. So, uh, We've actually took a light version of our data with Rover and we've put some extractors from the data with Rover behind the scenes and we loaded some PubMed articles to see how those, what our extractors would extract from those documents. So let me stop the presentation and go to our, uh, this light version of the Rover. So basically it's just a set of articles that we loaded it here. I'm gonna first search for a specific one that I thought of sharing with you. I'm gonna open this one. Basically, this is an article from PubMed talking about obesity in the Inuit, adipose tissue and ischemic heart disease. So what, what we've done with this article is that uh, we first took, we've applied two models here that I'm gonna show which are actually, if I, you remember the parts we talked at types, it's actually, of, uh, it's an entity recognition part. So we took a model that was trained on 700,000 uh, news articles to extract general entities from, from documents. So you can see it knows how to extract dates and it gets the dates even better than 
just using a normal regex. So it gets things like mid 1990s, you get periods like thousands of years. And this was very useful in, uh, in our automation use case where we had to extract, we didn't know, we had to support multiple countries. We didn't know the template. It was not a specific template because there were different types of permits. So we had to extract different dates from those permits together with some locations. So in our automation use cases, putting a model trade on these general entities, even if the model was trained on, uh, on newsletter articles, it works for, for this use case because it was they were the same, basically, general entities. So this knows how to, how to extract dates, locations, persons, and actually other uh, 15 other uh, entities, basically, uh, uh, because it's uh, a model, a neural net's what model uh, trained on a lot of data. In addition to this general model, I've, we've also applied on this particular article, we've applied a more specific healthcare, uh, spe healthcare specific model, which uh, was trained on PubMed data in this case. So we took a lot of PubMed data where diseases and chemical substances were tagged. And we trained a model to be able to extract diseases from this document. So you can see this is a constant entity of disease in white adipose tissue mass. And it also extracts chemicals, which things like omega-3 omega or fatty acids. And having this in place was helping us usually in our discovery use cases, where we empower our, our customers to answer questions like, what uh, disease is, are these chemical substances related to, or what what um, I don't know. What persons are are working in uh, are, have more knowledge about this this chemical substances or diseases to which we can go and get more answers. Okay, so uh, yeah, these are the the two models on entity recognition. So basically, this is the context where we've got some tag data or we use some publicly available tag data because it extracts general entities and we apply it to to solve an entity extraction problem for our customers but i've also mentioned entity linking which is basically using an ontology so you have an existing knowledge graph you have an existing ontology that you build you have some some relevant data in your company using that to 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 expand uh, the knowledge that you get from your content. And in this case, we took the mesh ontology, which is the medical uh, headings, medical headings ontology, which is the publicly heading. available. Yeah, which is publicly available. And we, we've built a pipeline to basically, we, we extracted uh, medical entities from this document. And then we did a, fuzzy search as my, my, uh, Michael uh, called it. So basically a similarity search, it was not a fixed search with terms from this medical ontology. And you can see, then we get to these things where you can see type two diabetes. It was actually matched to the concept of diabetes mellitus type two in MESH. And I've put a link here to the MESH ontology description which will give you all the relevant information about this, this uh, disease, so this concept in the, in the ontology. Same is with cancers, was actually detected at Neoplasm. So again, a link to that uh, concept in MeSH. So now again, in this, in this case, uh, we've, we've linked this data. So this ontology data will link it with your content. So again, use cases like discovery, so being able when you do a search, give me all my documents which mention type two diabetes mellitus, behind the scenes we're actually going to search for all the known synonyms. So all, all the known synonyms along the content and then get, get those results back to you. Similar to that, you can have functionalities like there's no search results for type two, but we know from this mesh that this are, it has other, you can see the tree structure, so you can maybe say, are you looking for type one? We've actually find documents which mention type one. So you can travel and use these relationships in order to, to solve your problem. Okay. 
same for same for compliancy you can basically link the person that you extract for the document you can, you can link them into your ad group and know is certain information about those persons okay other um, documents i can show you more about these extractors but things like these are the types of entities that we can we can also extract also an interesting part in we saw in one of our use cases is that if you can extract also quantity this must, might be relevant also in analyzing patients data and analyzing treatments maybe you connect that with the ontology and, and then you have all the information about the person which which you treated and and uh, the studies that are performed on those treatments so these are examples that uh, yeah basically what you can empower your uh, your entity extraction and you can use them to solve all these all these different use cases now i'm going to be sensible of time i can go ahead and show you more documents but i'm going to be sensible of time and move to the next uh, next part but happy to do uh, to dig deeper and have another session on showing more documents and maybe using models from different industries. Okay, moving forward, uh, what we want to go into the agenda is the next part is the rover, data with rover part. And basically the, the story of the rover is that the extractors we've presented now, we managed to, we saw a pattern that we can have these extractors solve problems for different use cases. So we saw a pattern emerging from the, the use cases we solved. And you say, okay, how we can reuse this to also solve that problem, how we can reuse that to, to enable this other client of ours to, to do this search. We can use this model that we've trained for in, extracting general entities on this public data. We can use it both for automation in this customer, but also for discoverability in the other customer. So that's why we decided to, okay, let's try and pack all of this and uh, basically build a solution, a platform where we can uh, have these extractors provide real value to, to our use cases. So that's what DataVis Rover is. Well, Vinder, do you want to go to this diagram of all the modules of the data with Rover and how they work together? Yeah, sure, Alex. Thank you. So this, this gives you a high level snapshot of what data with Rover is. It's basically, you might have, you know, existing systems like where you have your documents like in SharePoint, file system, documentum authoring systems and they might be in the very different formats like word pdf images you know something that needs ocr excel might be uh, you know uh, tabular format or non tabular format and you want to build one single platform which allows you to view all your data and you know have this intelligent search cognitive search so not just enterprise search but semantic search and not just semantic search but cognitive search which is you're all using machine learning models to train and be become better in tagging and doing extracting entities and tagging entities so data with rover is a set of you know accelerator packs and microservices which we built which you show at the bottom there so we have storage api upload api you can store to s3 azure different storage you that's like your staging area where you take your word document you extract text from you upload it you extract text from it after extracting text you might want to do ocr on it depending on the type of the document if it's a text pdf or an image pdf you then you'd invoke your enrichment apis and these enrichment apis is what alex was showing is the different models we have built and you can have one or many different models some of them could be based on your ontologies which you would have you know, curated or built in-house, or some of these could be ontologies that are public ontologies. Like in this case, we use the mesh taxonomy uh, to tag the documents. So the entity extraction is basically first extracting the keywords and, you know, understanding the part of speech, doing the part of speech tagging, and then doing named entity recognition. And then you have two options, either you can do model-based extraction or ontology-based extraction. Um, 
And this is where MarkLogic's data hub sits well because it allows you to have, you know, your data in staging area where you, you do the harmonization, you do the extraction, upload. And then once you have it ready, you have done the tagging, done the entity extraction, you move it to the final database where on top of which you have your search API, you can build your knowledge graph APIs, and you can build all kinds of visualizations on top of it, like clustering visualization, graphical visualization. Um, and um, what Alex shows you is a simple search UI on top of MarkLogic. And on top of this in the middle is the data flow orchestration engine. Now in data with Rover's case, we're using Apache and IFI, so some open source technologies also, and it could be AWS step functions or another type of orchestration engine, which orchestrates and invokes all these microservices. And you can bolt on your own existing microservices or you can use what we have already built. And so it accelerates the journey in building these intelligent platforms. And that's what Data with Rover is all about. Okay, thanks for the insight of what's behind the, behind the hood. Now that we've shown you the extractor, we showed you what's behind the hood, but now I wanna show you also a video of what uh, will the, the new UI that we're having now uh, going to provide in terms of functionalities and what actual uh, capabilities will that have out of the box and you can go ahead and use it. Now, uh, yeah, this won't be a long video, but the, the story of the video is that, okay, let's say you get, a, you get an email that, okay, we've got a PO from an old client called anywhere in this case, it's just this will make it harder for you to just use a normal text search. And okay, you need to answer some questions about this client. Do we still have an active contract? Are there any pending invoices? Who's the person we should go to for that? Now you open the interview rover, you have this, this nice search page to use. Let's first go over a bit. Let's say you have another batch of documents that you haven't yet loaded. So you go over, you load those documents. It might be from any cloud source. It might be a file system. It might be a network drive. And then you go to step two, which is the, which is the interesting part here, where you have to choose uh, the concepts and the domain of the documents you've selected in terms for us to, to apply those extractors and extract those concepts from your documents. So in this example, we've put some finance and education domains and some extractors uh, for the concepts on the right-hand side. But you can imagine on, on, uh, on what I've showed before, that you might have here the general domain, which is going to have the concepts I've presented about person and uh, uh, location, or you might have that healthcare domain extractor, which extracts diseases or chemical substances, or you might have the mesh extractor, which is going to based on mesh extract those ontologies. So you, you load your batch of data, you say, okay, for this data, I wanted to extract these concepts. So this is from corporate banking, just extracting these concepts. You add some custom tags to the documents. This is just to, to help you better organize your documents and have a better search them. And you, then you can choose to run this in the background and then get on with your search. On the left-hand side, some facets. So basically to provide that advanced search capabilities, let's say we first select the dates on which we are, we're searching for our contract and invoices, then we use the facets to further reduce this, the results that we're looking at. You can use the stats to see where you're at, get it to a number that you can use to, to, to go through the documents. And then another thing that you have uh, below the search bar is they extend your search. So basically we're showing you a list with the concepts that are most frequent in your search result. So you can see here, you have persons, you have facilities, you have languages, and you can use these concepts to add them to the search bar. So you can say, okay, I wanna filter by language. This will actually suggest, after you select the concept, it will suggest different values that we have in this result set. So you can say, okay, just choose, I want to see the English documents, but we'll also be able to do suggestions based on what you type. So if you type, start to type anywhere, we can see in your search results that anywhere it's in here, an organization is tagged as an organization. So you can actually choose that and do a concept search instead of a normal text search that will bring in everywhere, every document that actually mentions anywhere. 
then you'll find you'll have your your final result set let's say it's like 20 files it's fine the second result is a contract we see from the tags it's an active contract so that might be our result you open it you get in a in a document view here in the document view you can make use of uh, i've shown you this shown you this on the light version as well you can make use of the highlighting so you can choose okay i want to highlight these terms here in this video is just showing uh, anywhere where it's extracted but you'll also have a different view in not just browsing the document but browsing the relationships that we found between this document and other documents and these relationships were not predefined we didn't use any any keys for that it's just based on the extracted concepts and the tags you've applied so we can say okay these documents are related because they have this similar tags and they also have five or more concepts in common another way of visualizing these relationships are graphs as you well known from from all the other presentations and you can use these graph search to navigate these relationships and see okay we've we've saw from the previous tab that the invoices are there and the invoices are paid but let's see maybe if from this graph we can navigate the concepts we see okay these are the persons which are actually related and this is these are the most mentioned persons in our documents and in our contract so this might be the the person of interest to to contact for this contract so basically this is how we've used the data with rover platform to to answer the questions we we had and this is a discovery case that we have for the data with rover okay thanks alex now this is for the video we also have a yeah we've put here a q and a i don't know james if you want to just leave that for for the end yeah if that's okay we'll we'll leave that to the end uh, and then we okay. can uh, we can go through fantastic alex Alvinda. i'm going to stop sharing it's uh, an amazing platform that you've built there and i think it really shows the value of what what we're trying to talk about today and and how those entities can add value and what you can do with it so um, thank you very much it was super interesting uh, and guys hang on to the q a at the end and you, you can uh, ask away to these guys right with that we will hand over to smart logic so i'm hoping steve you are on the line uh, I'm hoping I'm on the line too. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Fantastic. Excellent. Okay, over to you. Right. So, firstly, um, better do this sharing of the screen. Um, always forget to press the second button. So, okay, hopefully, I can see something that says semantics powering digital acceleration. We can indeed. Yep. Cool. That looks great. Okay, uh, I'll, get, I'll proceed then. Um, so yes, hello, uh, my name is Steve Ingram. Um, I actually lead solution architecture for SmartLogic and I'm very happy that SmartLogic have given me this opportunity to present uh, my company, um, the product and, and how we contribute to, to digital acceleration. Um, so I hope everybody's awake. If you weren't before, you are now. Um, so I'm gonna present a few slides uh, and then demonstrate some of the um, capabilities of our product. Um, I've given, only got 30 minutes, so I'm not sure, I, I, don't, I don't think we'll have time for QA in my presentation, but uh, obviously put any questions in the chat uh, and we can pick them up um, at the end. So we've been around since 2006 um, and our tagline is, is revealing smarter decisions. And so this is all about making the most of your information assets, uh, driving acceleration by making sure you your partners and your customers extract maximum value from, from all the data that's uh, lying around uh, your organization, your ecosystem. We do this by providing a rich layer of metadata uh, and also allowing the companies to manage their knowledge models, so taxonomies, ontologies, business glossaries, control vocabularies, uh, in a collaborative approach that maximizes the contribution um, of the, the subject matter experts that are, are in your organization. We do this for uh, tier one customers worldwide. You might recognize one of the uh, uh, logos uh, towards the bottom left hand side. Um, and as we've been a MotLogic uh, partner since 2012, many of the large customers are, are joint projects and there are many others 
where we're, we're engaged separately, but the combination of smart logic and mark logic um, is, is a very powerful one. We're actually also a, a mark logic customer. The Semaphore cloud offering is hosted on a, a resilient uh, mark logic customer, uh, mark logic cluster. There's um, the common theme with all these uh, uh, projects and customers is it's it's typically text heavy, a lot of unstructured content, a lot of textual content, and typically in regulated environments. So you have to track what you're doing, what you're saying, uh, and make sure it's compliant. So while I can show you the logos, I'm afraid I can't I can't really go into specifics of, of any one of these cases, uh, but I will be discussing three applications um, of smart logic and mark logic uh, after my demonstration. So uh, fundamentally, we believe that metadata is, is, is the key to value. So in the same way that you wouldn't go for a trek outdoors uh, without taking a map with you, um, in the same way that metadata handled correctly uh, describes your, your data landscape. And, and we sort of view metadata in three kind of so three classes. There is the sort of static metadata, you know, the, the, the file size, the create date, the uh, source doesn't change much limited value, but it's useful to have. And then there's the layer on top, which is the semantic metadata, which is describing the meaning. So uh, who is the audience for this document? What topics are being discussed? Are there any products mentioned? And then the third category is, is, is sort of semantic metadata, which, you, which, which is essential for the decision-making process. So you know, what entities are in this document? Is there any PII mentioned? Are the products that are mentioned, um, the combination of them, does this need to be protected from export control? So this is you know, active semantic metadata and all, all, three, um, uh, all three have value. And, and Semaphore is around the management of that metadata and also the, the um, control of those metadata definitions. And, and that's one of the reasons that, that Gartner has marked us as a, as a, as a leader in the magic quadrant for, for the last Sorry, we're in the leader, leader area of the uh, Gartner Magic Quadrant for metadata management for the past four years. And it, it's kind of cool to be ranked alongside and, and often above um, the likes of IBM and SAP, especially when, we, when you're our size. Um, now, we see semantic metadata management as, as the key to delivering high order applications. So um, on the left hand side, you can look at managing your business glossaries, managing your reference data, and then starting to look at how the, how you manage your uh, model your operational systems, looking at implementing a semantic data catalog, supporting semantic search, supporting aboutness and subjective enrichment, extracting data data from documents using um, entity extraction and 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 and, and uh, semantic enrichment, powering deeper analytics, feeding it all into a metadata hub, um, looking at cognitive ultimate cognitive systems uh, and indeed knowledge graphs. Um, and these, uh, these obviously are applications for which, uh, which Mark Logic uh, is a great fit. So uh, there are three main capabilities within, within our product. So our product is called Semaphore. Um, and these are the, the uh, collaborative curation um, of knowledge models. So whether or not, as I said, these are taxonomies, ontologies, business glossaries, control vocabularies, uh, reference data, fact extraction definitions, they are all uh, knowledge models. They all map some part of your domain. Um, and we represent them as um, in SCOS Excel format in an RDF graph. Secondly, it's the use of these models uh, in combined with the natural language uh, processing engine to enrich content with uh, additional relevant um, and consistent metadata. And lastly, the use of these uh, models to harmonize vocabularies across your organization, power knowledge discovery, um, and, and, and typically drive uh, better decision-making and deeper analytics and that kind of thing. Um, and importantly, uh, we're designed to do these jobs at scale. So whether that's managing, uh, as we do for some of our customers, uh, taxonomies with, with millions of concepts, um, processing decades of, of medical information, or supporting thousands of queries per hour on a, a retail website, um, this semaphore is designed to, to handle um, precisely these kind of mission critical requirements. And all this is done with version five is now done from a unified uh, browser-based uh, server-side product. So let's look at how organizations typically deploy um, these capabilities. So um, if you're an organization, you have lots of information sources on the left-hand side, lots of uh, audiences on the right-hand side, some may be internal audiences, some may be external audiences. And Semaphore can, can work right across, across the board as part of what we call a semantic AI middleware 
uh, platform. So um, if you have content that's coming in, uh, it's unmanaged content, it's coming in from a website or it's third party content you wish to distribute on, um, we can make sure that it's matched with um, rich content, rich, 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 rich and consistent metadata. Um, and we can also make sure that uh, we can power semantic search over that. So we'll make sure that user queries can be mapped onto your internal ontology and then the content that's returned will be returned uh, because it matches that, that ontology or that taxonomy. And it's important to note Smart Logic is not a search engine. We work very happily with Mark Logic and other engines. Um, and we are all, all we do is manage taxonomies and mark up content. We are agnostic as to what you do with it after that. Um, so that's on the on the uh, unmanaged content. On the managed content, uh, obviously we can in integrate with CMSs and DMSs. We can provide additional metadata. We, we can make recommendations, or we can provide uh, automatic metadata over the top. And authors can also use us to choose metadata from from controlled vocabulary lists. We can um, uh, extend that down into data that's held within a database. So it can be if it's text, it doesn't have to be a document. It can be free text uh, fields in, in a database record. And lastly, because uh, our ontologies are based around uh, RDF graphs, they become an integral component of your uh, knowledge graph initiative. So you can start with the knowledge model that's, that we're managing through Semaphore and then extend that with, with uh, documents that contain those terms um, and other information, uh, other information as necessary. It becomes the foundation for, for the knowledge graph. And in terms of digital acceleration, so there's um, enhanced search and discovery. Um, we're using vocabularies are harmonized. So people with different business units, different frames of reference can find the same content. So if you're working with a consumer medical environment, you're going to have uh, patients using one set of terminology, care, uh, carers using another set of terminology, doctors using a third set of terminology, and you want to be able to route them back to the content. And if it's enriched from a, a consistent uh, doesn't matter what terminology it's using, you can find that content in relation to the user query. Um, we can match content to intent um, because we look at what the meaning of what a query means as opposed to also what the meaning of the content is. Um, and lastly, you can uh, obviously leverage unstructured text to uh, improve, improve decision making. So you really can make sure that every piece of a, a content in your organization is contributing in some way, shape or form. So if we look at, um, so what would be the, how would that impact various people within an organization? So we've got three kind of example use cases we use. There's Kit, who is a consumer, he's an analyst. Um, it could be internal, it could be external. Um, he's gonna be consuming what's the uh, content. June is a contributor. She's gonna be consuming and also contributing. And Sarah is a taxonomist. Um, and she's actually responsible for using, uh, maintaining the ontologies that uh, the rest of the organization and the customers are using. Um, so let's look at Kit's options. Uh, he's, um, as a consumer, won't be using um, Semaphore directly, um, but he will be using uh, enriched search, semantic search. Um, so in this situation, uh, this is just a demo. It's one of our standard demonstrations. He searched for Apollo 16 and back his content is classified as being about Apollo 16. So it's past our um, threshold, which you'll see when I come on to demonstrate the product. Um, we've had some high degree of confidence. It's about Apollo 16, even though the term Apollo 16 may not appear anywhere in that content. It's semantic, it's based around the meaning, not necessarily what terms appear in there. And also you can use the model to find what terms are, are related. Um, so he's, this is showing Apollo 16. So we can see from our model, we have the crew and we have the vehicle and we have the destination, other information that's um, so he actually, if you didn't know anything about Apollo 16, uh, then he can use that um, use the model to navigate. And on the right hand side, sorry, left hand side, we have um, refiners. So uh, this is all metadata been provided by by Semaphore. Um, and because this is all using, uh, you know, it's a knowledge graph. Um, we have the concept. Um, everything is labeled with that uh, ID or that URI. Um, you can use that. So if documents are classified with different subjects um, or extracting different facts from those documents, you can immediately place that in context and uh, because everything carries a URI, it's all, um, it's all marked up correctly and you can display it as a, as, as a knowledge graph, um, as I think you saw with, with the Amgen, Amgen example earlier. So that's, um, that's Kit, hopefully happy. Uh, June, uh, as a contributor, so as, as she's a consumer as well as a contributor, so she will be able to benefit from the same 
capabilities in terms of semantic search, semantic discovery, and uh, knowledge graph in terms of being able to, and, and knowledge graph in this case is very useful because if you have the source material tied to your ontology, you can trace back and see uh, key information, find the provenance of information, um, and you can see you get you get that in depth view if you need to really, really deeply research something you're, 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 you're creating content on. Um, but then she start to interact more with with Semaphore when she's actually authoring content. So anything June creates can be um, uh, automatically classified as part of the workflow. Um, so rather than her think up lots of metadata items, she can do that. Uh, the machine will do it for her, um, or she can choose from uh, the control vocabulary and populate the, the metadata manually. Um, so in this way, very easy, very simply, um, content is better marked up, and better described. And if it's got decent metadata on it, um, it's 50 percent, uh, sorry, about 48 percent easier to find content that's got uh, well described with, with accurate metadata. And we're not forcing her to do it. And secondly, she can integrate integrate directly with, with Semaphore. We have something we call the knowledge review tool. And this is designed to let uh, subject matter experts who might be authoring content also contribute directly to the model um, and I'll, I'll show you how that works uh, in the demonstration but this does mean that poor old Sarah doesn't need to know everything about her organization what she can do is lever, leverage the information from the subject matter experts um, so hopefully that's June and now let's look at uh, look at Sarah so Sarah is uh, information management spe specialist uh, experience in information architecture information science and her job is to maintain the ontologies which are being used by Kit and, and used by June and their colleagues. So she gets a lot of toys, toys to play with. So she firstly has Semaphore Knowledge Model Manager. It's a collaborative, it's a browser-based tool for managing ontologies. Um, and I'll be demonstrating that, that later. Semaphore includes um, what we call side panel widgets. So Semaphore's smart logics philosophy is very much there is always a human in the loop somewhere. So um, because the information is going to be consumed by a human, the human is the ultimate the arbitrator for what, what is, is important. So, um, but we provide tools to assist in the management of these models. So we have the lexical resources side panel, which uses some machine learning over 40 million Wikipedia articles. And what this does is suggest concepts that may be relevant to, um, to topics in your ontology. So you can provide additional in, 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 in ritual, additional enrichment especially if you have, say, just a standard set of definitions and you want to make, obviously, the richer you make your model, the better the classification. Um, and so we're providing tools to assist you with that process. Um, we also, if you're working in a multilingual environment, we provide a translation widget. So if you have your definitions in English, you want to de deploy a model to Spain or Russian speaking um, customers, then we can convert the, uh, the labels, um, or the tool will convert the labels for you. Um, Quite often we, do we talk to customers and they say, well, I don't have an ontology in my organization. That is never the case. There's always one set of definitions. Um, if it's in uh, a semantic format, great, we can import it in. So if it's in SCOS Excel, it'll import in. If it's SCOS, it'll import in. If it's AL, we can convert it and it'll used alongside any other definitions you provide in Semaphore. Uh, but typically these definitions are um, in Excel format. And we have a couple of wizards for importing uh, ontologies, which are just uh, Excel definitions. Um, uh, Sarah can use, well, so, as I said before, when you saw that June was able to contribute to the model. Um, so Sarah doesn't need to learn everything about her organization. She can just manage the contribution from her, her users. If um, users have their own sets of definitions, then we have the model mapper as part of Semaphore. So definitions can be supplied by a new business unit, for example, if they want to come on stream as part of an enterprise taxonomy project, they can say these are the definitions we use. Zara can take that set of definitions, map it onto the existing ontologies, taxonomies, see where the overlap is, see where the disjoint is, and then uh, adapt accordingly. I recommend a strategy for them to be incorporated. And most of all, um, Sarah's job is made a lot easier because people can realize the benefit they get if they maintain their taxonomy properly. Uh, they will get automatic classification. They will not have to fill in all these metadata values themselves. So um, very quick charge through various applications of, of uh, Semaphore. Let me um, now actually uh, run the product itself. So hopefully. Right. So this is, um, hopefully you can see, welcome to Semaphore. 
This is uh, my local uh, server, demonstration server. It's running uh, the most recent version, which is Semaphore 5.2. Um, it's This is just a, a browser window. It's a collaborative system. I'm logged in as, um, as just as an administrator because it's my machine and I use it for, for development and demo purposes. So I have full access to everything. You can partition, you can partition, obviously we, we support multiple users. Uh, you can limit who can see what, you can limit the functionality people have. You can limit people to working in QA environments versus uh, stopping them from working in the production environment. Uh, and I can, because I have access, for example, I can actually see all the servers that are running and I could uh, manage manage them from here as well. So the first thing I want to do is just demonstrate um, what we mean by semantic enrichment. So to do this, I'm going to uh, run what we call the, the document analyzer. And this is a um, test tool into our classification enrichment server, which is in a deployment we'll be running in the background processing documents from you know, SharePoint or MarkLogic or from, from what other, other system we might be using. Um, and I'm going to drop in, um, oh, actually I'm going to open it first. So uh, it's a Word document. It's about, um, it's actually um, a Wikipedia article for on Apollo 11. And I'm going to drop it in um, and I'm going to classify it against the server, which has actually been configured with uh, the Apollo 11, uh, sorry, been configured with the space missions, space missions ontology. So on the left-hand panel, you should see the text that we've extracted from the document. And we support something like 300 uh, document formats. This is a Word document. So you have the, the text we've extracted and also we've, we've identified a table. We're putting the table for the rows back as well. And on the right-hand side in this, Pane, we're showing you the um, semantic enrichment. So these are all concepts from our model. Um, so you're seeing the concept type, I think it's an astronaut, the label, John Young, and a confidence score, in this case, 0.72. Um, if you want to actually see um, what's coming back most, um, you can see that it's uh, Astronauts, NASA, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, and Neil Armstrong, which is good because it's about Apollo 11. Um, and then other definitions uh, in various categories are below. We actually look at topics, though. So we're classifying for named entities, astronauts, and organizations. We're also classifying for general topics. And we see that coming back is, is the concept uh, Apollo 11. And we have a confidence score of 0.59. Now, um, we can query the document. We can, so we can highlight and, and we can see that it's uh, mentioning Michael Collins, Saturn V, uh, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong. I must have accidentally clicked a couple of things. Um, I've got something else active, never mind. So I've got we, we, Michael, Neil Armstrong, my, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, Saturn V. It's got the Apollo 11 call sign. It's got the Apollo 11 um, Cospar IDs and, and, and uh, SCN ID. Um, but if we actually were to look at the document itself, uh, there is no mention of um, Apollo 11 anywhere in this document. So it mentions Apollo more than a few times. Um, it doesn't actually mention Apollo 11 anywhere. Um, but because it's the crew of Apollo 11, it's talking about the launch vehicle of Apollo 11. It's using the call signs for Apollo 11. There's enough evidence in that document for us to say safely well, with a confidence score of 0.59. It is about Apollo 11. So if I then had this as part of a search engine, user types Apollo 11, they will see this document, uh, this will be returned. If I want to know more about why this classification has taken place, I can interrogate it. And I can actually see all the different labels and I can see where the, the variants are generated and where the matches are. And uh, if I want to go into detail, perhaps edit the, the, the concept to modify something because it's over firing perhaps, then from, because we're in a unified interface, I can click on here and it will now open the model that classified that document. It'll open it on the Apollo 11 concept. Um, and I can actually now uh, go to town um, and then look at the definitions and maybe make some changes if I need to. Uh, it's on my machine, it's a little bit slow, but now look, there we go. So this is gone before we were running Document Analyzer. Um, now we're running, uh, we've switched to the Knowledge Model Manager. So on the left-hand side, we have what we call the concept schemes. Um, some of these could be hierarchical, some of these um, are not. Um, and it doesn't matter. We're not, we're not shoehorning the concept into a particular point in the hierarchy. So these can be polyhierarchical. They can be any depth. They can be any complexity. Um, it's not a problem. This is multilingual. 
So we have Apollo 11 in uh, preferred label, German, English, Spanish, French, Japanese. Alternative labels, which could be just other synonyms, other ways of referring to Apollo 11, again, in multiple languages. Um, or they could be specific and meaningful. So in this situation, because Apollo 11 is a space mission and we have a class assigned here, we have uh, call, sorry, call signs, uh, S-COSPAR IDs and SCN IDs. So these are alternative labels, but these have semantic meaning. Um, an astronaut doesn't have a call sign. An astronaut might have a nickname, um, but a mission has a call sign. So we can actually label, may apply meaningful labels. Underneath here is um, the uh, metadata. So this can be useful for um, providing best bets or explanations when you're looking at a, uh, doing it from a search perspective. And on the right hand side, we have the relationships. So uh, this is a mission. So we have a crew, spacecraft, launch vehicle, launch point. Um, and this is all, all, all sensitive. So I wanted to add uh, a relationship. I can just click on here. I'm going to see the, the relationships which are valid for a mission. So, uh, and if I choose the um, in program, for example, and as I type, it'll just give me suggestions from uh, that are meaningful for that. So I could add the Apollo space program or Apollo Soyuz test project if I was to click here and add that. Uh, oh, it's giving me a, um, some information as well. Um, and I can just add that, add that triple, um, add, add, that, sorry, add that relationship. Um, there's a visualizer involved. Uh, we just provide you with a, an active view of the current concept and the um, related concepts. So if you wanted to wander over to Buzz Aldrin, we can go over to Buzz Aldrin. Um, and obviously we want to go back, uh, we, can, we can do that. Um, and everything is, is logged to history. But uh, what I wanted to do really is show you um, the lexical resources side panel. So we have a, a side panels here, and this is an open API. You can provide your own definitions. You can integrate with your own reference systems if you want to. And we provide three, three, three widgets with, um, with uh, uh, semaphores. So one is what we call, this is a Wikipedia widget. So basically what it does is it takes your concept. It looks it up in Wikipedia, and you could maybe um, drag, drag some information uh, from here um, and, and drop that in into your um, uh, into your model. You know, obviously, you, you could you could drop it in here if you wanted to. Um, useful for reference data. Useful for providing related concepts. Um, may not be used for actually enriching in your model. And that's where the other two come in. So the first one, as I mentioned on the slide, Sara can use the lexical resources side panel. So what this is is an index of forty million Wikipedia articles. Um, and what this does is it'll take the label that your uh, the concept that you're working on. Um, fire it into the, the index and to return any clusters of terminology that are likely to be related to that concept. And we have three, three classes. There are signpost terms. These are terms that we have regarded as having high uh, correlation with, the, with the, um, uh, the, the concept. Terminology clusters, perhaps slightly less, less confidence there. And then uh, at the bottom of the list, there are some, some other related um, uh, clusters that come back. But we can see here we actually have a cluster around um, fake moon landings and um, hoax moon landings. Um, so uh, what I could do if I wanted to enrich my model in that direction, I could select those terms and then say uh, add them under and they'll become additional additional alternative labels that actually become additional evidence. And so that way if we wanted to have content that was about fake moon landings, we could also classify that as a poly uh, that, that would have contribute towards it being described as about Apollo 11 as well, if we wanted to. And then lastly, um, translation side panel. So we do have our definitions in um, German, English, Spanish, French, and Japanese. If I wanted to add Russian to that, um, I could take the English labels as a, a root, and I'm gonna send it off to uh, a server and back will come the uh, Russian translations for Apollo 11. Uh, and again, um, this is both a preferred label. If anybody speaks Russian, I'm pretty, I've checked it in Google, I'm pretty certain that's right. And this is definitely on surface tranquility base, which is a translation of the English label for the call sign. Um, and so I can now add these in uh, if I wanted to, and it's giving me the, the suggestions and the, the concepts. This is my demo model, so I won't actually update it, but if I save that, they would be committed as, as uh, additional concepts. So that's, um, so that's the knowledge model manager. So that's the fully function tool for uh, you know an information scientist. But as I said earlier, uh, one of the things behind, behind Semaphore is it's designed to be uh, collaborative. So I can 
we have what we call the knowledge review tool. So I'm going to log in as a less privileged user. I'm going to log in as user one. Um, and if I log in to the system, um, you will see that um, I have access to a small number of semantic models. Um, and I have this, this, this is telling me that I only have read access to these models. So I can, I can see, but I can't change any of these. I can see uh, space missions, but that's because I have access to what we call a task, which is a, a controlled area of a model. So why that's more useful is uh, we have something called the knowledge review tool, which is a simplified interface. So um, if I logged in here, I could go to knowledge review tool, which is a, a URL that you can distribute inside the organization. Um, and I'm going to go into a task which is has actually been set up to allow me to make changes. So I'm logged into user one. Uh, I have access to this task. And then what this means is I can now make changes changes to the model. So if I'm a subject matter expert, I don't have to fill in a spreadsheet and send it off to the, to the library department. I can actually actively change the model. Now I'm not going to change anything in production, as you'll see, but I could I've got complete control. I, 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 well, you can also limit how much can be changed. So for example, you may have a translation team, um, uh, say Chinese translation team or Chinese partner. You want to provide definitions for your concepts to deal with Chinese concept co content. Um, you can make sure the model is left as it is. They can't change anything. They can't delete anything, but they can provide additional definitions, uh, different diff additional Chinese labels um, and uh, without risk of, of damaging anything, uh, anything else in the system. Um, but let's say I, I'm allowed to make changes. I, they, I'm, I'm trustworthy. I, I, I'm, I know what I'm doing if I'm updating space missions. And I want to add uh, Elon Musk in there because why not? Um, so I'm going to, it's not in the model currently, so I'm going to create a new concept. And Elon Musk, yeah, well, actually, oops, I spelled the name wrong. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, next, um, I could uh, tr translate his preferred label. Uh, I won't. Um, I'm going to say he's an astronaut. And let's just say he's also known as money bags. Um, save that. Oh, oh maybe Tony Stark. And move on. Um, provide the additional metadata if I wanted to. Um, next, uh, what missions was he crewed on? What's he's related to? Um, uh, but I'm happy with that, so I'll finish that. So um, Elon Musk has been created and he's now been added to my task. But he's not been added anywhere, although well, he's, he's there. So I could have added, if I'd actually attached him to a program, he would be in the model somewhere. I haven't done that, but there is, Elon Musk is now sitting in my task. Um, now I could get, carry on working, carry on fleshing that out. But what's not, what isn't happening is that isn't going into the master copy of the model. But if if somebody was to, you know, with, with the right level of access was to log in. So let me just um, open up a window. Go into, actually, sorry, I'm really sorry. I should log in as, as administrator. I'm gonna go back in as um, master. Uh, I just wanted to show, I forgot to show you first time around. Um, given that I'm an administrator, I can see a lot of models. I don't have access necessarily access to all of them. Um, just these are the ones that have been uh, I've been added to or uh, I created. And there's a lot more than the limited list that you saw when I logged in as user one. Um, but I want to go into um, space missions. And I want to actually see what's happening in uh, user one's task. So let me select task. Just while you're doing that, uh, Steve, just let you know we're running short on time. So give you a okay. few minutes. Yeah, no worries. Um, uh, there we go. There's in, this is his change. And the first thing I'm, I'm alerted to, the fact is Elon Musk has been created as, as a as concept. And then what I can do from here is uh, approve, accept or decline that concept. And uh, I can also, once I'm happy with that, I can commit those changes through to the master. So it's a collaborative approach. Uh, we can uh, bring information in from uh, uh, other, other subject matter experts. Um, one thing, um, let me, you, you saw with the Amgen presentation, the fact extraction, frame, uh, fact extraction being used to pull metadata, pull document data from, from unstructured source. I'm gonna just demonstrate that with a, 
slightly uh, different example. So this is um, so this is a uh, U.S. Treasury um, guidance note actually about human trafficking, um, and they they issue these guidance notes uh, periodically, um, and this has a lot of information on human trafficking, but the key thing that this particular uh, customer needs is, um, this is a project, is to, uh, they, what they want is the red flags, which are key pieces of information. What they, they wanted to do two things with these. They wanted to extract them from the PDF um, and then notify particular customers of certain clients, uh, type um, of, of particular red flags that were issued under this, this guidance note. And then also what they wanted to do is start to be able to surface uh, any key key, tra key trends, key, key features using your machine learning. Um, and obviously this is a big document. They, there's an awful lot of stuff in here that would be just noise to a machine learning engine. Um, but what they really want to do is train it and play with it, these actual definitions themselves. So what we do is um, in the same way that we're able to provide semantic enrichment, we have a, a special type of model, which we call a fact extraction definition. Uh, and then we process we process the document against against that um, that that model. So again, left hand side you're seeing the text read from the PDF. Right hand side you're seeing um, the metadata that we've extracted. But in this situation, it's not necessarily sub subjective metadata. So although we have fingerprinted it and said it's a guidance note, but with the key pieces of information is what we're going to feed to the downstream systems. So um, we're extracting the actual guidance itself. And so we're normalizing it and say the regulator is a financial crimes enforcement network issued in 2014 under reference A008. We can also find other instances of the same pattern. So we can return information um, which is describing other related uh, guidance notes. But then the meat of the application, what they really want to do is actually look at these red flags. And so we can define a pattern. Um, and what we're basically saying is this is tabular information we don't really care what the table looks like. We don't care where the in the document the table is, but if it's a if it contains descriptive text, um, if it refers to uh, institution types like credit unions, money transmitters, uh, it's got regional information optionally, uh, discusses various types of financial transaction. That is a red flag, and we want to su process surface each one of those and and process them. So and that is actually what what we're doing here. And it's a declarative process. So if we wanted to be prescriptive, we could actually say specifically link the table, or we could look for specific rows. But what we want to do is saying actually we want to surface every um, every row that is relevant. And in fact, you see this one is is uh, has all that information. If we if we go lower down, um, we're seeing information from a different a different different table. It's still a red flag um, for human trafficking. Um, and in the ballistic situation just has a description and it has an institution. There isn't, you know, we, we, we aren't forced to, um, we're not forcing the system to return information that only has, um, oops, that's the wrong one, um, only has, uh, sorry, I actually can't read today. Yeah, so, you know, it's what we want is description and it's institution, the region and the transaction type, additional information and it's optional, but that's the key. So this will surface all the red flags from that PDF um, and it's all driven from uh, ontologies and taxonomies, which, you know, so in a medical deployment, absolutely, we're reusing all the information that is already uh, being used. Um, I had a couple of use cases to, to go through, but uh, if you think I'm out of time, I could stop there. Yeah, I think the music's playing, unfortunately. <laughs> no worries. Um, so let me just finish with that slide. Um, so... It's easy. So it's a lot, a lot of slides, a lot, a lot, lot of text here for a, for a summary. But the, but the basic point is, um, our mission is all around a business, allowing businesses to tame semantics, and then use these to solve the problems that have been historically difficult, um, and for which MarkLogic is, is an excellent solution. So thank you for your patience. Um, there are other use cases described in the slide uh, deck, which I'll, I'll leave behind. But um, uh, thank you for thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Steve. It's really interesting. And I think one of the things for me is showing the power of what smart logic can do, especially around that classification element. And, and I think you can see how it all layers together and why we've got all these people on, on this one demo. And you've got Mark Logic being the hub here that's taking all of that knowledge that's being fed from, from smart logic and giving you the rich search 
And then you've got products like um, DataVid Rover that's then giving you that beautiful UI and bringing it all together and making it manageable. So I think these things all really complement each other and, and, and shows what we're talking about here, which is taking your content and, and enriching it. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, let me just share my screen. And um, yeah, so I think the, the important thing is, you know, uh, many of you might like your customers and as far as we're concerned, that means you're already well on your journey uh, to the things we've shown today. And we show how they layer together and the value they all bring. Um, I think it was really interesting that the stuff that we were showing with Amgen, we touched on in a few other cases where the documents aren't just flat content. You can mine those documents, pull the data out and make business decisions with it, make analytic decisions with it. You can create search interfaces. You can do all these amazing new applications. If only you can take the knowledge from your document. And I think what SmartLogic and DataVid showed is that there's a real power in there to do that. And then we can help be the back end to help you put that data and scale it. Um, and hopefully next week, uh, we've, we've got lots more information about the kind of applications you can build. So we're going to talk through some of the next gen applications that all of this can, can build on top of your content. We'll show some existing use cases from customers. We'll show some of the tools we've built. So if you've got business people that you want to get excited about knowledge graphs, semantics, and the things that you can do, bring them along to this third session next week. And that will really hopefully get them excited, get them enthused and inspire them about things that you can do. Um, feel free to reach out to us uh, if you've got any questions, if you want some follow ups, we're more than happy to talk through what you've seen on this session, the last one, and, and talk through what's coming up. Also reach out to any of the partners you, you've heard from today. You know, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to speak to you about opportunities. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I, I can see that there's been lots of chat going on in the chat. And I think most of the questions have been answered. Just one from um, Steve, uh, who was looking at, um, the question was, why is RDF preferred over graph for storing triples? Um, now, Steve, this is a, a, an answer from my more, slightly more technical colleague, uh, Michael, um, who says that an RDF is like a graph, however, graph is more general. RDF modeling is used to store semantic relationships, whereas graph modeling can be used for analyzing things like path among graph components or determining centra centrality, uh, the importance of certain nodes, or determining communities among the graph nodes, which evaluates how groups are clustered and partitioned. So that's the answer from, uh, from Michael there. Um, again, if you've got any questions, um, feel free to reach out to us, uh, csm at marklogic.com. Uh, we're always happy to connect you to our partners or to some of our um, guys here that can answer some of your more technical questions, um, as well as if you want to learn more about the business value of uh, some of the, the, the use cases discussed. Wonderful. If anyone's got any questions, please feel free to come off mute and, and, and uh, raise them. As actually, a side point to that, that RDF graph uh, question. Um, there's better typing within RDF at the moment. Um, so you can, you can check, you can, you, you can, you're prevented from creating links that don't make any sense. Um, but I'm sure at some point, um, you know, property graphs will catch up. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's interesting. I'll, um, I'll, I'll bring that up with Michael. Okay. Well, if that's it, everybody, thank you so much for your time. Thank you to our presenters for joining. And um, we hope to see you all next week on uh, Next Generation Applications. Thanks, everyone. And um, we'll speak soon.